Let us pray, O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit, this instruct the hearts of thy faithful, granted by the same Holy Spirit, may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Lord God, we thank you for this day, for this moment. We thank you for this series that we are about to begin. We thank you, Lord God, for the wisdom of St. Augustine, who is our patron, and today St. Jerome, Lord God. Help us to have a passion for your word, Lord God. A passion for God, as St. Augustine had, Lord God. So that today we may truly understand the value of Eucharist, and we understand, Lord God, our mandate, that preferential option for the poor. Lord, give wisdom to our Archbishop as he proclaims that word to us today, and all of those who will be involved in this series, Lord God. Bless it, Lord God, and we ask, Lord God, to grant eternal rest to Father John, who has been a symbol for us of option to the poor. We make this prayer to you, Father, through your Son, Jesus, union and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, St. Augustine, St. Lucy, St. Jerome, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the third lecture in the Father John Reginald Lecture Series. I'm your host, McCovell Comby, Program Officer here at the Cardinal Kelvin Felix Archdiocesan Pastoral Center, located at East Winds in Maris Hill. The first two lectures in the series focused on Father John, the man, the priest, and his pastoral ministry. Today's lecture will focus on the spiritual foundations or principles which underpinned his ministry to the marginalized in our society. Foundations and principles which is relevant to our own outreach to the marginalized. The title of today's lecture is The Eucharist and the Poor, and it will be presented by the Archbishop of Castries, His Grace Gabriel Malzer. I will invite Deacon David Popo, Director of the Cardinal Kelvin Felix Archdiocesan Pastoral Center, to give us a brief bio on His Grace Archbishop Gabriel Malzer. Deacon Popo. It is my pleasure indeed for me to just to give a brief bio about His Grace. Archbishop Gabriel Malzi was born in St. Lucia in a community in the community of Monrepo. He attended the Monrepo combined, the Miku Junior Secondary, and the V Fort Senior Secondary Schools. From 1975 to 1979, he taught at the Monrepo Combined School before proceeding to the regional seminary of St. John Vianney and the Ugandan Martyrs in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to pursue his theological studies. After his theological and spiritual formation, on July 28, 1985, he was then ordained to the Holy Priesthood for the Archdiocese of Castries. During the years of his ministry, between 1984 and 1987, he served as an assistant parish priest in Our Lady of the Assumption in Souffre, St. Lucia. From 1987 to 1989, he then studied for the Master of Arts in Theology and Missiology at the Catholic Theological College Union in Chicago, the United States of America. Between 1989 and 1992, he was the Deputy Director of the Archdiocesan Pastoral Center, now called the Cardinal Kelvin Felix, Archdiocese and Pastoral Center based in St. Lucia and assistant as well in the parish of the Good Shepherd, Babunu. From 1992 to 1993, he was parish priest of St. Lucy's Church in his hometown in Miku, St. Lucia. Between 1993 and 1996, Archbishop Gabriel Malze was involved in the formation at the original seminary of St. John Vianney and the Ugandan Martyrs, where he was also a lecturer in theology. He spent in Rome thereafter, the years 1996 to 2000, 
student for the licentiate and doctorate in systematic theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University, where he obtained the doctoral degree with a thesis on the relationship between Eucharistic theology and the social doctrine of the Church. According to the Magisterium of St. Paul on the poor and the suffering. From 2000 to 2002, he was involved in formation and was teacher for the second time at the Regional Sem Seminary of St. John Vianney and the Ugandan Matters of Trinidad. On July 10 of 2002, he was appointed Bishop of Roseau, Dominica, and received the Episcopal ordination on his 45th birthday, October the 4th, 2002. So he was then, I think, the youngest bishop or one of the youngest bishops at that time. From 2007 to 2011, he served as the Apostolic Administrator of the Diocese of St. John's Baste. From 2017, he was the president of the Antilles Episcopal Conference of Bishops. And on the 24th of April, 2022, he was installed as the Archbishop of Castries, St. Lucia. My brothers and sisters, it's my pleasure to, again, as I said, to introduce his Grace, His Excellency, Archbishop Gabriel Malze. It is certainly a pleasure to be here with you um, to present this third lecture in the series on Father Reginald John and his pastoral work with the poor. As you've been told that the title of my presentation is Eucharist and the Poor. What is the goal of what I am going to present to you today? I will attempt to establish the relationship between the Eucharist, which is the source and the summit of the total Christian life, and our responsibility as regards the poor and suffering in our midst. The source of my presentation will be my, my publication, which was done in 2014, Eucharist and the Poor. I don't know if any one of you have read it, but it would be a source material for you um, subsequent to this, this lecture. And also, it was a reproduction of my doctoral dissertation, which it was, was written in, in the year 2000. What was the original title of that thesis? In fact, it forms the subtitle of the book, and it is the identity and the mission of the church as illumined by the teaching of Paul VI on the analogy between the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and in the poor and suffering. So this is the, what this, the thesis was all about. The identity and the mission of the church, how the church ought to identify with the poor through its mission as illumined by the teachings of Paul, Paul VI, on the analogy he sees between the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, which of course for us is the real presence, and the poor and suffering. How do we see these two mixing or informing each other? So the thesis was inspired by a quote from the message of Paul VI to the Compasinos of Colombia when he visited on the 1st of September, 1968. Now the Compasinos are the poor people. So in the, during his visit at the time, he, he spoke directly to the poor. And this is what he said. 
he said to the poor people. And this is what inspired my, my thesis. He said, you are a sign. You are an image. You are a mystery of the presence of Christ. The sacrament of the Eucharist offers us his hidden presence, living and real. But you too are a sacrament. That is, a sacred image of the Lord among us as it were a representative, but not hidden. Reflection of his human and divine countenance. We recall what a wise and great bishop, Bozwe, once said with regard to the high dignity of the poor. All the church traditions recognize in the poor the sacrament of Christ. All the church tradition recognized in the poor a sacrament of Christ. Not indeed identical. In other words, we're not saying that the poor is Christ. Not indeed identical with the reality of the Eucharist. But in perfect, analogous, and mystical correspondence with it. So in other words, the Eucharist which is so dear to us and so meaningful, meaningful to us, it has to say something to the reality of the world in which we live, especially for the weaker ones. As we move along, we'll, we will discover what I mean by all this. Therefore, that study, it sought to examine the view of Paul VI, who was born in 1897 to 1978, that there is an analogous relationship bet between the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, in the Eucharistic element, which is which we use on the altar, and the social presence in the poor and suffering. That is what he sought to explain to us, and I seek to capture in the thesis. And this will be presented, I'll present this in, on the four themes, four sub-themes. One, the mind of the church regarding the poor and suffering. How does the church, the universal church, our mother church, how does it view the poor among us? Secondly, I will look at the poor and suffering in the salvific plan of God and in the related mission of the church. In other words, what mission does the church have of necessity towards the poor? Thirdly, the mystery of the Eucharist as the locus of the compassion of Jesus for the poor and the suffering. The Eucharist, the mystery of the Eucharist as the locus of the compassion of Jesus for the poor and the suffering. And finally, the liturgy, what we celebrate every day, the liturgy and the Eucharist, which is the continuing school an actual practice of social love. How the Eucharist ought to be a school for us to teach us how we are to treat the poor among us. First, the mind of the church regarding the poor and suffering. From the opening paragraphs of the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, God it spares. This is Second Vatican Council. And one of the documents here is the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. How the church understands its presence in the modern world. What does it say to us in terms of our understanding of that reality? The church says in the very first paragraph of that document, Gaudium et Spes. The joys and hopes, the grief, the grief and the anguish of men of all times, of our times, especially of those who are poor and afflicted in any way, are the joys and the hopes, the grief and the anguish of the followers of Christ as well. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community composed of men who, united in Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit, they press 
onwards towards the kingdom of the, of the Father and are bearers of the message of salvation intended for all men, for all men, not one group of men. That is why Christians cherish a feeling of deep solidarity with the human race in its history. And when we speak of human race, we're talking about everybody. Again, in the dogmatic constitution, Gaudium et Spes, which is in, in this document, it says, just as Christ carried out the work of redemption in poverty and oppression, so the church is called to follow the same path if she is to communicate the fruits of salvation to men. Gaudium et Spes, number eight. I think the first one I must have mistakenly, um, it should be lim Lumen Gentium. Wow, sorry. Okay. So according to, to Paul VI, in the sacrifice of Jesus, all human poverty and pain find the true meaning. That's his understanding from what he knows that the church, where the church stands on the poor. It finds its meaning and the ultimate liberation. And in the Eucharist, the faithful discover the grace to serve the weakest and the most hurt. And in the sacrament, the future reality of justice and wholeness is anticipated. So when we celebrate the sacrament, we are at the same time saying that we are ready to heal the world of all its pain and suffering. How we do that and how we, we fall short of it, this is, the, this is what we have to deal with. And I suppose this is what Father John attempted to do. Thus, the Second Vatican Council succinctly describes the Eucharist as the source and the summit of all Christian life. Now, these are terms that we repeat all the time, and they sound very nice. But to really ponder on them, that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of all Christian life. Christian life in belief, Christian life in action, Christian life in meditation, Christian life in, in anything that we do. It is from Lumen Gentium 10 and Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the, sac the, the, the document on the liturgy of number 10. To this, Paul would add, or Paul VI would add, the Eucharistic mystery is the font and the climax of the public mission to the poor and compassionate with Christ, uh, Christ the head. Yes, the font and the climax, the same thing as source and summit. That's, that was the mind of Paul VI in that regard. He was so concerned about the plight of the poor in his pontificate, and not only in his pontificate, in his uh, episcopate as well, while he was um, Archbishop of Milan. In fact, he used to visit, visit the, the prisons very often and always carried with him a, 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 a little um, musket to celebrate mass with the prisoners in Milan. And I remember a quote in which he said to the, to the prisoners one day, you know, that um, we, are, we, are the, we are the same. It's just that you have been caught, but I have not been caught. You know, we are all sinners, he says. You have been caught, but I have not been caught. So what I have presented here is to show how, what the mind of the church in relation to the poor. We say many nice things about the poor about how our responsibility as church should be, but the challenge remains. Secondly, how we, we view the poor and suffering in the salvific plan of God and its related mission of the church. What plan 
has the poor in the mission of the church? Do they inspire us? Do they speak to us? Do they tell us what we ought to do? Let us explore that. In his inaugural speech, in which he presented his vision, Jesus spoke, or he speaks of being sent specifically. He said, I have been sent to bring good news to the afflicted and to proclaim a year of favor from the Lord. That was his focus in his inaugural speech, what we would call his mission statement. The first thing he said in Luke chapter 4. So, of course, Paul VI had many things to say about how he understood what Jesus was presenting to us. So to a group of sick persons in India on one of his visits, he said to them, I came because you are God's favorite children, of whom he has asked the greatest sacrifice, and to whom he has entrusted the heaviest crosses, but also because you are those whom he consoles with his love, with his graces, and his choicest blessings. That's how Paul VI saw the poor. That I came because you are God's favorite, favorite children. Is that our mind about the poor? Or do we more often than not see them as nuisance? I think the latter is true for all of us. All of us are challenged by that. In a, a Christmas sermon, he also said, who were the first to encounter Jesus? For whom did he receive the first place or reserve the first place? And to whom did he, did he offer the privilege of friendship, dialogue, communication? To the poor, the worker, the humble. He did not call the great, the philosophers, the powerful, the rich, even though they too are invited. But the first are the simple people, the common people. That's what we see in the Gospels. So where are we in relation to this? In the same Christmas sermon, he added, The Lord came to you. And when he wanted to introduce his plan to the world and to explain what had befallen of humanity, and what profound transformation needed to be accomplished? What did Jesus say in the greatest act of his, his teaching mission? He simply said, blessed are the poor, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are the poor, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Luke chapter 6 verse 20. So therefore, we could say that in his view, Paul VI, he saw poverty and deprived conditions serving as a kind of measure for the humanization of the world. So if there is a lot of poverty in the world, it means that it is questioning the humanization of the world. First, from the point of view of the challenge it presents to the simplicity of life that we all are called to. And secondly, from the perspective, perspective of realizing what needs to be done in the, in the areas of human betterment. So really and truly, whether we rationalize it or not, because all of us, we are challenged by it. The disparities that exist in the world, I mean, they are really disturbing to us, but they are there. What we do about them is really the question. So by recognizing this as a vocation, by presenting it as a vocation, Paul VI is affirming, and maybe we could say paradoxically, that only the poor can inspire the real transformation that the world demands. Only the poor can inspire the real transformation that the world demands. That is to say, the need to cultivate citizens for God's kingdom. 
They are the ones who can welcome the kingdom in the most childlike disposition as the gospel requires. We see so many instances where Jesus referred to becoming like little children, becoming poor, blessed are you poor, and so on and so forth. And I don't think Jesus was saying that because it was a nice thing to say. Because he re recognized how disparities in the world can make people less than human. Less than human. Or at least in the perception of each other. Paul recognizes that this in itself is a difficult language, just as it is a difficult language for us. When we speak of poverty and uh, the plight of the poor, this is difficult language. Why? Because our modern world is steeped in a climate where people are, you know, trying to eliminate suffering for its own sake. Nobody wants to suffer. And any living condition that would be a means of, of effecting it, expressing this understanding in today's reality, he said this, and I quote. He said, we would like a gospel which is more peaceful, more facile, more comfortable, and more conformed to our deep instinct and desire to move pain from our lives. The first being voluntary pain, which is sacrifice. What would a gospel be that is, or that is Christianity without the cross, without pain, without sacrifice of Jesus? It would be a Christianity without temptation, and without salvation. The Lord has saved us by the cross. He has, he has given us new hope and the rule of our lives by his death. He showed us the example. We cannot honor Christ if we do not know our Savior. And we cannot know our Savior, or we cannot honor our Savior if we do not honor the mystery of the cross. I mean, these are nice language that we could use, but in reality, in reality, that's what Christianity is all about, to teach us how to, 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 to imitate Jesus in the varied ways. So he shows that only a gospel which knows suffering and sacrifice has the ability to save. And only a Christianity that is born from the cross can be efficacious and be worthy, be a worthy means of transformation. Now, we just need to unravel these in our ordinary lives. I mean, we would say that any successful parent who has raised kids, their success, I am sure, is determined by how much sacrifices they have done for the sake of the children and the children themselves have made. It always boils down to that. So he said that a gospel, that only a gospel which knows what suffering and sacrifice is, is able to save. The cross, he says, is the source of strength, of spiritual energy. It gives value to all our efforts and to all our pain. It is the key to enter the kingdom of heaven and gives the reward of eternal life, the cross. This is not easy language. I, I remember when I was writing the, the thesis, invariably, whenever I told anybody what I was writing, they frowned. Why? Why are you writing this? Why are you researching this? So he says that just as the cross was for the Jews and the Romans in biblical time a symbol of curse and absurdity, so it is for Christianity the symbol of wellspring and of new life. As life characterized by compassion, which is difficult, forgiveness, which is difficult, solidarity, which is difficult, love, which is difficult. These are our challenges. Therefore, Christianity, without the cross, as the pontiff would say, is non-existent. Christianity, without the cross, is non-existent. And put simply, human salvation is in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I even usually say that Christianity is a religion of the cross. Although 
the versions of Christianity that we see being spotted around don't speak too much about the cross. We spoke about prosperity. You plead the blood of Jesus and you will be saved and you'll have all kinds of things. But true religion, true Christianity is religion of the cross and nothing else. The Pope goes on to indicate that only a church which is trained at the school of suffering and sacrifice is, is able to empathize with the crying needs of humanity. Only a church that learns at the, at the school of sacrifice. In it, every believer has the capacity and the opportunity to make of the church a sign of Christ. So if we are to go seeking how we can be a sign of Christ, it has to be in empathy with what Jesus himself identified. To render him present in the context of today's culture, and especially where he is most needed and where he is suffering most. That's where the mission of the church is. And again, I'm not speaking of it because I have accomplished this because it remains a challenge for me. So thirdly, the mystery of the Eucharist as the locus, as the place that every time we celebrate it, it is a place of the compassion of Jesus to the poor and suffering. That's what we experience. or that, That's what we ought to be seeing through the Eucharist. So how does Paul VI explain that? So for Paul VI, the gospel account of the multiplication of loaves and fishes which we have several texts in which he did so, it provides a paradigm for understanding his compassion towards the poor and suffering. It serves as a symbol of the Eucharist, which he later established as a perpetual sign, which, of course, Jesus multiplied loaves in reality. But he used those same loaves to symbolize in perpetuity what would truly represent, represent his compassion and his presence in the world. We see in the, his comments on the, on the Johannine version, the version of John on the multiplication of lo loaves in the sixth chapter of John, how he used that text to explain the Eucharist. So the miracle which Jesus performed was not only a sign, or a lesson, or a symbol. He did it in order to make something else understood, something immensely greater. That is, he would have liked to multiply another type of bread. In fact, in the, ne the next day when he moved across to Capernaum, he found a great crowd because they had crossed from the place of the multiplication. They have crossed the sea on, into Capernaum because they were seeking for bread from him. And he took the opportunity to teach them about the Eucharist. And he says, I am the bread of life. This is the bread that you, you should be seeking. Not the bread that, that, that you know, spoils and you eat it and it goes to the sewer. But the bread of life. And he taught them about the Eucharist. In fact, we regard the sixth chapter of the, of the, of the, of the John's Gospel as one of the key explanations of the Eucharist. So for him, the Eucharist signifies and expresses the deepest form of divine love towards humanity, as it is communicated in the person of Jesus. It is indeed the love that is given. That's what the Eucharist is. A love that is given, a love that multiplies itself. It seeks to enter as interior and vital nourishment within the heart, that it should sacrifice itself, immolate itself, and represent itself as victim to redeem others with its life. That's what the Eucharist does. You know, it's the greatest divine act of love. Why? Because someone gave himself completely as something that we ought to imitate. Someone gave himself completely, immolated himself. According to the Pope, 
Jesus in the Eucharist is hidden beyond the face or behind the face of every human person, especially those who are humbled and who, those who suffer. Whenever you did good to one of these little minorities, the misery stricken, the afflicted, the poor, the languished, you are doing it to me. So when we talk about the analogy between the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and the poor and suffering, this is what it is. It's an analogy, but it's real. You're doing it to Jesus. Thus, as a principal participant or recipient of the, com the, the compassion of Christ, suffering humanity becomes a symbol and it becomes a sign and a true human sacrament. Because in our catechism, we learn that a sacrament is an outward sign of inward grace. Hmm? So, this, so the poor, the suffering humanity becomes a sign of Christ. Now, this, this is mind-boggling eh, for most people because our, our, our entire task is to move away from suffering into, 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 into some other level of life. And it's not, uh, it's not that we are proclaiming that people should, should remain in that, in that condition. We, uh, we are saying that if this condition exists, it's an indication of what we need to do in order to bring, to pe bring people to a more humane condition. So they are, you know, inspirations to us as to what we need to do. And their presence, it cancels out the, the mystical, the mysterious presence of Jesus. It brings us into reality. Because we have right before us what is lacking in the world. What is lacking. So, so much for the Eucharist as the locus as the place which gives us an understanding of what we ought to be. And fourthly and finally is that the liturgy, what we celebrate every Sunday and every day, it has to be a, a continuing school that we, every time we come to the Eucharist, we come to school. We come to learn. We come to learn how to love. Because on the altar, someone is being immolated every day. Someone is laying down his life on the altar every day. That's what we are representing. Because the, the Mass is a representation of the cross. Of what happened on the cross. Every day, that is happening. So it's a school. We, we come to learn how to embrace the cross. And then it is moving us to actual practice of social love. That's what we come to do. This is why I, I say to people, we don't come to be entertained at Mass. We do not come to be entertained. We come to imitate, to emulate. We come to, 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 to learn, to learn what we ought to do as Christians. And every time we listen to the Word of God coming from the Scriptures, it, they challenge us as to what we ought to do. So let us see what... Paul VI and other people too had to say about how we should see the Eucharist and the, and the liturgy, the liturgy of the Eucharist. According to Paul VI, in the celebration of the Eucharistic liturgy is contained the breadth and the profundity of the entire divine mystery, which is to be discovered and lived in the human social milieu in the social order. In other words, we have to take the mass to the world. This is why the priest says, go in peace, to love and to serve the Lord. After you have communed, after you have received Christ, you have to take Christ out. So in there is the, the breadth, the profundity and the entire divine mystery, which is to be discovered and lived in the human social milieu. It is indeed for him, a school of social love. That's how Paul VI describes the Eucharist, the school of social love. The Eucharist is the place where Christians learn to be disciples. They learn to listen to the heart of Christ as it beats for the cause of human beings. 
It is a place where one learns to respond to the reality of the temporal world. If we really consider what we do when we receive communion, automatically we think of our brothers and sisters and how we can bring about the healing. Again, I want to stress the fact that it's not because I in any way have arrived. No. This is the challenge. The challenge to everything that I celebrate on the altar. The cliche, food for myself is a material question. Food for my neighbor is a spiritual question because it, food for my neighbor causes me to do something. That's a spiritual question. When I eat food myself, that's a material thing because it feeds my body, yes. But anytime I, I, I venture to help the neighbor to be fed, that's a spiritual question. And Pope Paul VI endorsed that. According to the encyclical Populumum Progressio, that is one of the greatest encyclicals written by Paul VI. I think it was in 1968, I think it came out. This is what he says about the plight of human beings, how they, they, they move from lesser to greater human being. He says, conditions that are, more human, uh, that are more human are the passage from misery towards the, the possession of necessities, basic necessities. You move from misery to the acquisition of basic necessities. Then victory over your scourges, the growth of knowledge. You know, people must go to school to educate themselves. And we must provide possibilities for that. And the acquisition of culture. That is moving people to greater self. Additionally, conditions that are more humane are increased esteem. How pe when people begin to believe in themselves, they begin to believe themselves as valuable. Increased esteem for the dignity of others. The turning towards the spirit of poverty. And then we, we, we begin to see a different view of people. Moving with the spirit of poverty is, is inclusive. Is looking at others and bringing them in. Cooperation for the common good. And the will and the desire for peace. This, uh, this is the, the movement, the process towards the humanization of the world. You know, you move from poverty, move into education, you satisfy human needs, and eventually you work for the common good. You don't think of self, but you think of others. This is what he has as a key text in Popular and Progressio. So the Eucharistic liturgy cannot be properly celebrated if the Christian community ignores those existing needs. In other words, we are saying that our Eucharist is incomplete. Of course, it's, it is valid. It is licit because it is done by a priest. You know? But it does not mean that it is sufficiently efficacious. By this I mean we do not necessarily attain the fullest benefit of the Eucharist because of our state of being, our state of life, because of the state of the world. We may be doing very nice liturgies, very beautiful liturgies, people all joyful and clapping and everything, and they go home very happy, but it does not mean that for them that the Eucharist has been efficacious because there is still incompleteness in our world. We still snub our neighbor. We still look down on those who are less fortunate than ourselves. All of us, eh? All of us. No form of Christian liturgy yields its full significance in the life of its participants if it lacks the cognizance of the basic elements which contribute to its meaninglessness. In other words, once there exists among us inequality, we in danger. Our task as Christians is to try, to try to solve the problem. That's why we have social institutions, you know, social groups, St. Vincent de Paul, Marian Home, uh, St. Lucy's Home, and all this. This is why they exist, so that we can, you know, alleviate those situations. 
The love that comes from the Eucharist is universal. It is for all. It extends itself to all. Consequently, the love of the neighbor is the authentic proof of the love of God. That's why Jesus put the two commandments together. And John, in his, in his epistle, says that you cannot tell me that you love God and then you hate your neighbor. You cannot show that, you cannot say that you, you, you really love God and yet your neighbor is suffering and going to bed without, without food. You know, you know, practical. Love must be practical. The Eucharist has to become practical. In the words of St. Augustine, the Pope advises Christians saying, extend your charity to the world, and if you wish, I mean, not if you wish, he said, extend your, your charity to the world if you wish to, to win Christ. So if we do not extend ourselves to the world, that means to our neighbor, to the poor, to those in need, we cannot say that we have Christ. Because the members of Christ are living in the world. Hard language and hard challenge. Therefore, in his understanding, an indispensable purpose of the Eucharistic liturgy is to guarantee and renew Christian motivation to social love. So remember early on I mentioned that when we come to, to, to the Eucharist, we come to school to get that motivation, to generate that effort to, 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 to attend to the poor. Because he says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And many people do not have it. The act of taking part in the Mass ought to have practical implication, application. Unless the mass becomes practical, we're wasting our time. Maybe nice and sacred and sanctimonious, but if it does not translate into social action, then we are wasting some time. Yes. It has become practical and in the observance of charity, justice, and social relations. The participation in the Eucharistic banquet, in a word, is an invitation to correct the unjust social inequalities among persons, among sectors, and among peoples. All these, I'm, I'm sure, are, are not new to any one of us, but of course it is worthwhile really looking at, looking at it within the context of what we celebrate every day. And sometimes our disposition to, to us is basically sanctimonious and not within the practical realm. The mystery of the Eucharist, he says, both challenges and illumines the moral life of the church. By participating in it, believers are formed into a community of the people of God. So if the Eucharist is properly celebrated with all the preparation that is made in our ordinary life, then we, we build up the community of God. I mean, because in our world today, everybody turns selfish. Everybody wants to be before themselves. But they're not forming, we're not forming a people. Disposed to carrying out the principles of the church, that is, that is to teach us justice and the ways of Christ. A justice that shifts one's focus from self to others. That's what Jesus did. You know, that's what he shows us on the cross. A shift of focus from self to others. Love, it says, is always recognized in what love does. We can say from now till doomsday that we love God. But if it is not demonstrated in what love does, we're wasting our time. As regards the mission of the church, it is revealed in apostolic action. St. Vincent de Paul, as all the groups that I've mentioned, it, we must have apostolic action. And we must be determined to multiply a few more. Because we, there is a lot of people who are suffering psychologically, emotionally, and otherwise. It is the means by which the faith of the church is made tangible. 
This is, this is where, where we know that we Christians, and Jesus himself said, you will know that they are Christians by their love. A love that is seen. Not a love that stays in the people's hearts and their heads, but a love that, that becomes tangible. It is the love that saves us. The one that is in action. In this way, one understands that salvation, that the salvation engendered by the Eucharist is not only eschatological. In other words, es the eschaton is about the end times. You no, know, things about it, or future times. But it is realized in time, in the present. It is actualized in the here and the now. What do we have among us? If we have deprived situations, it is not a heaven that we're building. You see. It must be in the here and now as the fruit of the whole moral act of living, of giving, of sacrificing for the sake of the church. When the channels of communication among people are built, the hungry are fed, the guilty are pardoned, strangers are welcome, the sick and the lonely are consoled, and every person is helped to discover his rightful dignity. The same kind of process that, that popular and progressive was offering, the gradation of becoming more and more human. He says when there is vital communication in any con Christian community, automatically the hungry will be fed, the guilty will be pardoned, strangers will be welcomed, and the sick and lonely will be consoled, and every person will discover their own and their rightful dignity. And I'm sure we know that this is lacking among us. And the celebration of the Eucharist becomes a true proclamation of this, the, the, the supernatural sociology of Jesus. It is called the supernatural sociology of Jesus. In this way, it symbolizes and it actualizes what it signifies. So the Eucharist, in other words, the, tu the true Eucharist is in the action that takes place outside of the church. The sacrament takes place in the church. I mean, the, you know, the symbolic stuff. You know, it happens in the church. But the actual Eucharist happens when it is in action. That is why, at the end of the Mass, the priest says, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Now, so from now I'm going to go to the fourth century of quotes from, you know, renowned people, great, great philosophers and theologians. One is St. John Chrysostom. He, he was called the, the, the man with the golden mouth because he was a tremendous, great preacher, you know, and he said many things. And he had a, a certain understanding of what the Eucharist that he was celebrating should make, make him into. So St. John Chrysostom showed the awareness of this analogous relationship between the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and the, in the poor. When he admonished, he admonished the, worshiper, the worshiping community of Constantinople, because he was the bishop of Constantinople, and he said this. He said, you have tasted the blood of the Lord, but have not recognized your brother. You dishonor this table, not judging fit to share your food with him who was considered worthy of sitting at the table. And he continues. In two instances, other instances he said, because he is poor, a poor man, give him to eat because it is Christ who is nourished. Give him to eat. Give to the Lord in his hunger. Clothe him in his nakedness. Receive him in the stranger. Going back to the gospel message, whatever you do to the least among you, you are doing it to me. Language that we know. So strengthening, strengthening his position on the reverence that is due to the poor, in whom Christ is analogously present, he said, and I quote again, this is what he said, a long quote. When you see the poor believer... Think 
that you are beholding an altar. Can you imagine that? When you see a poor believer, think that you behold, you're beholding an altar. When you see such a one, a beggar, not only insult him not, but even reverence him. Isn't that absurd? Reverence him. And if you see another insulting him, prevent, repel it. For so shall you yourself be able both to have God's favor and obtain the promised good things. Let us make a chest for the poor in our homes, near the place at which you stand praying. There, let it be put. And as often as you enter into prayer, first deposit your arms, and then send up your prayer. And he continues, and as you would not wish to pray with unwashed hands, so neither do you do so without arms. Since not even the gospel hanging by your bed is more important than the arms. He says that the arms is even more important than the gospel. If you hang up your gospel and do nothing, it will do you no good or no great good. But if you have a little coffer, you have a defense against the devil. You give wings to your prayer. By doing arms, he says we give wings to our prayer. You make your house holy. Having meat for the king, there laid up in store. What a powerful saying. John Chrysostom in the 4th century. St. Augustine too had some things to say. He was the Bishop of Hippo. He shared insights on the inseparability of the presence of Christ in the mystical body of which the poor is part, of which the poor is part, and the Eucharistic sacrifice on the altar. When he, ended, when he stated, if you are therefore the body of Christ and of his members, then your very mystery lies in the Eucharistic means. So everybody, our body lies in the Eucharistic species. Because that's why we have offered tree. We're bringing up ourselves, everybody, not only the, the, the nice people. We bring up the mystery of the whole people. And he says at the end, be what you see and receive what you are. So that's what the Eucharist is. The Eucharist is our body. Be what you see and receive what you are. Because you're receiving yourself, in other words. When the, the Eucharist is com complete, we are really receiving what we already are because we are the body of Christ. So I shall end with a beautiful quote from Mother Teresa. And she says, a very powerful quote, the greatest disease in the West today is not TB or leprosy. It is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. There are many in our world who are dying for a piece of bread. But there are many more dying for a little love. The poverty in the, in the West is a different kind of poverty. It is not only a poverty of loneliness, but also a poverty of spirituality. There is a hunger for love. There is a hunger for God. This is a quote from Mother Teresa. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, going back to the Eucharist, if the Eucharist is the source and the summit of all Christian life, therefore, it must speak to our practice of social love, which is directly, directly, directed mainly to the poor and the suffering in our world. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.
So right now we will open the floor to any questions or comments which we may have to His Grace on what he has shared with us. Your Grace, is there is one thing that have always bothered me. And I always feel as, a, as Catholics and as a Christian church, why it is if we do not know somebody, their history or know them in person, we believe that they do not need help as a poor person. Yet we cross the roads every day and we see poor people. They are commonly assembled right by the, what used to be the courthouse. And sometimes I feel, I feel their pain, I feel their plight. I say, Lord, if I had time, how much I would do in a day. And when I look around and I see people who have time and they do nothing about it but just to congregate and talk all sorts of subject matters, yet they're in such dire need. There's one man that strikes me a lot. He wears a khaki clothes, walking up and down the moon, and he ends up right where he said by the courthouse with a big apple sack on his back. He's in rags, literally he's in rags. It touches me a bit. Use about. the mic. Use and, I'm trying, and I'm trying to figure out, as a church, as a Christian church, how can we really reach out to persons like that and draw them back to salvation and help, and help them to recognize that they have a purpose in life and they can, we can really help to change their life around. We all have different skills and I believe if we explore the skills, know the persons and ex help them to explore their skills, they can help themselves and they can help others. And that's what I would really like to see us address as people. Because they become alcoholics, they become drug addicts, they become prostitution, they become all sorts of things that they should not be. Only because if we put our best foot forward and try and assist those persons, we can help to make a difference in their lives. So I would like to see how, as a church, we can address such matters. Thank you, Your Grace. Yeah, well, well, I mean, I don't have all the answers to a question, but this is where our challenge is. I mean, is um, a question of studying our society and seeing what, how our pastoral ministry should, should, should display itself. So that's where the challenge is. And, and of course, we're not starting from scratch. I mean, there are lots of things that are happening already. Um, it's just that we have to augment it, augment them, um, and, and seek maybe new and creative ways of doing so. But, you know, the, the whole area of, of, of working with the poor, it's, I mean, all of us will agree that it is not easy because it's really going against the current, uh, going against, you know, the, 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 the thrust for achievement, I mean, in our world. Um, so uh, I think it is along with what Christianity is by itself. Um, it calls us to uh, a kind of lifestyle, a kind of um, disposition that is different from the way the world is going, in, uh, just in order to really make a difference and make, make a change. So, so uh, all we have to do is to, I think, um, to develop, to discover practical ways in which we can do that. And of course, that is open to exploration. Yeah. Portugal has already been established. I am Monica de Treville. I'm from the community of Ciceran. I'm happy to be here today. Why I am so happy to be here today? God called me to do a job. And I never knew what I was doing was a call for love. I walked all the way in the community. Everybody know Miss Monica. I visit the poor, the underprivileged, the shutting, I am there. Then I realized there was hunger. So on a Sunday, I opened a kitchen and I named it the Over Kitchen not knowing the meaning of Geo Vagira. Then I started cooking for the elderly. 
from, from 2006. I have been all during the COVID. Mm -hmm. I am cooking, and I got a friend mm -hmm. to transport the food mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. But then I fell and hurt my back, and I had to stop the cooking. Then I realized they don't eat only one day. They eat every day. So what I started doing, give them dry goods. So they would go cook food for your family. Not even realizing what I was doing, but I'm happy to be here today to know that what I am doing is servicing the Certainly. poor among us. Certainly. This is my country. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Your Grace, for your lecture. It really opened my mind to a deeper understanding of what Eucharist is all about and why I attend church. And um, while you were talking, the thought that came to me from scripture is that the poor is always with us. So Jesus expects the poor to be with us, to really challenge our own consciences and so on. But what I am asking is that we talk about church and Eucharist and the poor, but there are other things outside there that challenge us, like the social structures that we have. How do we as church advocate that the social structures, you know, attend to the poor? I mean, we have a lot of unemployment. We have a lot of exploitation. Mm -hmm. We have low wages. Mm -hmm. We have incest. Mm -hmm. We have domestic a lot of social problems in yeah, our society. Yeah, yeah. And if these people are to be understood mm -hmm. as being poor in relation yeah. to Eucharist, the poor is not only those that we yeah, see on the streets, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are just symbols of a mm -hmm. deeper yeah. problem. So we need to understand, mm -hmm. you know, what is happening, mm -hmm. how the church can advocate right. on behalf yeah. of our people whom we do not see on the streets, but yeah. the family who is struggling, mm -hmm. the husband right. and the wife yeah. and the young person, yeah. the unemployed, right. the underemployed, mm -hmm. the exploited person. How do we advocate so yeah. that we can bring people to a deeper understanding of what Eucharist and the poor yeah. is all about? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you, you've raised um, certainly a very significant point. Um, I mean, the, the topic on Eucharist and the poor is really uh, focused, but it is at the same time all embracing. And I would like to use what I have mentioned um, in, in my, my lecture of um, using the, 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 um, the commission that the priest gives at every mass, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. That is to change the social structures as well. Whatever it takes, whatever it means to bring the mass into, into your ordinary life. And all that you have listed there are included as well, you know, because if we are, that's why using the, 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 the parable of, um, or the story of, of whether it was Matthew or Zacchaeus, well, let us see you Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was converted onto Jesus, and he was a tax collector. Um, the, the scripture never tells us that he stopped tax collecting but he was a better tax collector because he wanted to give four times, you know. If, you know, the professionals in, 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 in ministry today or in, um, in offices today could see themselves as Christians, I mean, we would not have thieves in banks, we would not have um, people corrupting in, in corruption in government. There would be a Christian um, minister, there would be a Christian lawyer, there would be a Christian this or Christian that, you know, so that if they experience the kind of conversion that Zacchaeus experienced from becoming a crooked um, tax collector to a wholesome tax collector, that's mm -hmm. where our challenge is. Because the structures don't fall from the sky, they are made by people. So that, you know, if a government, for example, were to really embrace Christian principles and say that, okay, we're going to 
to live a Christian principle within our government. You know what that means? That's a challenge, you know. So, so all of us, we, we, we are called similarly to use whatever profession, whatever vocation we have to make it the best that it can be. And all is included. Yeah, well, and, yeah, and church yeah. has to become much more deliberate than what is happening. I agree with you. You walk into church, and then okay, yeah. we have a lot of non-nationals yes, within yes. our yes. our, and then people come to church, and some of them do not even understand yes. what the priest says. Yeah. So the word has to be preached so that it can yeah. you can understand it, yeah. and then there comes about yeah. some change, so you can go out yeah. there. With but the, if you do not understand the word, mm -hmm. it, you cannot bring it out. Yeah. So, and that's another level altogether. I mean, but, but I'm saying that uh, the ministry of the church has to be all-embracing so that we don't see it as this um, just holy act, but we have, it has to be, 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 be transposed to every aspect. You know, so people have to, uh, you talk about understanding the word. That is part of, of our mission as well, to make sure that the word is understood so that people can live the word. Thank you, Your Grace. Um, yeah, I felt like I was back in university. I wouldn't mind coming back here a little more often for those kind of discourses. Beautiful. Uh, two, well, two points. Um, I'm just curious to know why you selected um, Pope Paul the uh, and really stressed a lot of your decision based on, on his works. That's just a, a passa. My more important question is this. Um, it takes faith to believe in what we're talking about. And as we, we hear from different sources that most, a lot of Catholics, more than 50%, don't even believe in the real presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. So we have a fundamental problem starting getting off the blocks. And furthermore, we keep talking about Catholics should believe in this. To me, the whole world has to believe because that is what it is. So we ought to go beyond the bounds. We have a long way to go. But in our Catholic catechism, it says there's a connection between purity of mind, purity of body, and faith. I can't remember the exact paragraph, I could find it if you wanted, but, and to me, we have an incredible problem with faith in the world today, generally speaking, and obviously a greater degree of lack of faith in the Eucharist. Because of this problem of purity of mind and purity of body, and I'm talking specifically about pornography. It is rampant, it is worse than rat poison, it is everywhere. Excuse me, but we, 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 we never, we, we're not facing it. We're not facing it head on in a methodical manner. I, I don't ask me how to do it. But I think it is something that we have to take on board because otherwise that is usurping all the attempts that we're making otherwise for people to grow in their spirituality and grow closer to faith. And, and then to go the next leap, which is I'll, I'll be Christian to my brother and sister and everybody else who's in need. Pornography is, 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 is terrible. And um, I think the church needs to make a concerted effort to start dealing with this issue. Well, Thank you. Yeah, first of all, you asked why I, I decided to, to, to write on this. Yeah? Well, first of all, I, I've always been um, attracted to the Eucharist. And all I had to do is to find someone, a proponent of the thoughts that I, I, I wanted to bring forward. And Paul VI was, 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 was such, you know. And I, it was quite, quite a journey. And I... I, 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 it was something that I enjoyed doing and uh, very challenging though, very, very challenging because it was at the same time challenging my own faith as to what, 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 what I do and how I, I express my faith. So that is it. And the, the question of the pornography, I mean, it is really telling us, you know, the state of the world. And it's not only por pornography. We're dealing with, with the gender issue and, and a whole, whole set of issues that we're dealing with today. And uh, we, we certainly have to set up our, our positions on, on those and seek to help, especially... Well, right now we have um, going on at the college, um, the, the Youth 2000, and we have a, a whole, about a, I would say, about a thousand young people there um, last night. Um, and uh, they, they are faced with all these issues today. The, the cell phone is providing them with all kinds. And today, in fact, in, the, in my homily last night, I was saying that, to them that, yeah, they, they're being called to, to make a difference, to really look at their lives differently. 
Now, this is just one little moment that they will have to, 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 to question things. But in terms of how we posture ourselves to, to help the, the young people to, to, to address the situation, and not only young people, because the whole church, because the, the, the issue that you've raised is not only among young people, it's among a, a lot of people. So let me, let me put it in a very short way. Our work is cut out for us. We have work to do. And we have, as Marilyn would say, we, we ought to be more deliberate in everything that we do in terms of where we stand on issues that, that we have to do. Yeah. According to what you have there, Your Grace, if the Eucharist is the source and summit of all Christian life, therefore it must speak to our practice of social love and is directed mainly to the poor and suffering. Um, for me, the Eucharist is a source of nourishment. And as Catholics, I think we don't take that as we should. Um, the reason I'm saying that is because, let's look at caritas. What is caritas as it means to us as Catholics? Um, I work, as Ms. Monica said, with the caritas in my parish. And I feel that caritas does not do enough for the parishes so that we can help the poor and suffering in our, in our communities, in our parishes. I remember one time I was teaching um, one of my confirmation classes and I asked the question to the children, um, what impact, what would impact you more? For example, if your um, cell phone is taken away from you for a day, or you had to feed a poor or take care of the poor. And to my surprise, most of the children said that taking away their cell phone for the day would impact them more than, you know, taking care of the poor. And I'm saying as a Catholic society, when we come to church, that that should be something that when we leave the church, we know that we're doing some sort of social love so that when we go out, we can practice so that we can give back to our parishes. And I think as a Catholic community, we're not doing enough of that. Again, you know, the, if we are to self-examine, we will always um, discover what more we can do. In fact, and the, that's the purpose of, of, of the, le the lecture series, as a matter of fact. Uh, for us to examine um, in light of what uh, Father John undertook. I mean, he was not a perfect person, but he tried his best to alleviate one dimension of life. Today, ours, it is multiple. There are lots of areas that we need to address. So what you've, uh, you're addressing here is, is an indication of the more that we have to do. So let us not be discouraged and continue to do whatever little that we can do to make the world a better place. Um, His Grace, I have to thank you, you know, for the lecture. It's a lot to take in. And um, especially now, as I've, I guess my age, it's very hard to retain a lot of things. So I'm wondering whether, you know, we'd be able to get either a copy or something. So... Okay. To, to buy $50. Okay. All right. <laughs> Not a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, I was just wanted to remark on what you were saying about the poor. Um, like, you know, you see them around the place, but some of them, although they are poor, I don't know, they have a lot of pride. Um, say a Saturday morning, there is you know, a gentleman who comes around and he feeds them, or, you know, some people come around and they feed them. And some of them won't even go for the meal. And they'll tell you, me? You know, that kind of thing. So, and I know also for St. Lucy's Home, St. Lucy's Home used to take in some people, and they would actually leave the place, and they'd rather go back on the streets. You know, so... You have to wonder how. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember uh, in class, um, 
in one of my classes at the seminary, it was Fa Father John Theodore um, who made a statement to, to us in the class regarding working with the poor. Um, poverty is, uh, to my mind, a, it envelops the, the entire person. You can, you can be poor intellectually, you can be poor socially, uh, physically, and otherwise. And he was warning us as, as students, because, you know, as students, you, you learn certain cliches, you know, identification with the poor, option for the poor. And as, these are nice sayings when you're a student, you know, uh, because you don't really know the reality. And he says, you know, be careful, you know, that um, you know, if you want to work the, with the poor, you have to have the spirituality that goes with it, because they will juke out your eye. <laughs> you know, it's true. Because, um, you know, poverty is poverty. Um, and what you're raising there, you know, all, the, all, all, all that, the resistance of the poor. I mean, you might want to take them to a, to a nice home, and so, but they go back to the streets. Now, uh, we try to rationalize this and try to say, you know, we're trying to get a better life for them. But they, they are experiencing something that that we, we, don't, we don't experience. So, so the question of understanding really the whole area of poverty. I don't know if Papa wants to share because he, he's the expert on that. <laughs> you, I don't know if you want to say anything, but I don't know. I mean, but um, I, though that's what I'm saying, that um, it's a reality. And you made reference to the fact that Jesus said, the poor we will always have with us. We will always have. So we will always have work to do. We will always have work to do. And we may find fault with this institution or that institution that is not doing well enough. The question is, what am I to do? Um, Jerry was saying about time, you know, um, which we, if, we, if we had more time. But um, I think, you know, there is one practice that um, the church encourages us, you know, to do before we go to bed you know, to examine our conscience before we, we fall asleep, you know, and, uh, and to ask ourselves, how did my day go? What did I do or what did I not do? You know, did I do enough? How, how should I, I use my time? You know, did I use my time properly for today? When I met this or that person, did I address them properly or did I respond to them in the way that I, I should have all these things you know so that's why the, I think the church is wise to ask to allow ask us to, to to examine ourselves and I think in a bigger way as we look at our ministry today we have more and more to examine what we are not doing and how the poor might be escalating and we are not sufficiently addressing and therefore because it is not happening, then our Eucharist is affected. The working with the poor is a whole issue, the working with the poor. But I think more fundamental than that is what his grace was trying to help us to understand. The relationship between Eucharist and that responsibility <laughs> to not sort of give up on the poor and see the poor as a negative, but see it as a constitutive part <laughs> of living out a Eucharistic life. <laughs> you know, that the poverty, the poor person, or the structures of poverty, that that, the transformation structure, is an, it's part of our Christian challenge. In other words, if you are a Eucharistic person, you must be a person who's engaged with the poor poverty at all the time. That, that's, I think that's, that's really the, what is coming out of His Grace's thesis there. And what it's suggesting to us is that so many people, for so many people, Eucharist is a liturgical act. You know? It's like saying the rosary or something like that, you know? But that understanding of the relationship between the Eucharistic act, Christ's self-giving, and the transformation that we are called to do to society, <laughs> This concept of love, the love of God, reveal the love of Christ that is redemptive of the world. I, I, I don't think we, we really 
are very close to that here. So there are many, many people who are very Eucharistic in the sense that they go to Mass on Sundays, they receive the Eucharist all the time. They haven't got a clue. <laughs> they haven't got a clue of what we're talking about here. You, you know? And so you may say, but, but how can people be going to receive the Eucharist and they don't care about it? It's precisely because of the lack of understanding. So part of the, our challenge, of course, is the deeper Eucharistic catechesis. We have to really help people to understand the Eucharist. And if people really understand the Eucharist, then they would naturally be socially conscious. They will naturally be involved in transformation of society and, and so forth. So it's, it's, it's a challenge to us in terms of understanding Eucharist. And the beautiful thing about it is that, you see, since Eucharist is the, 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 the summit, it means that our spirituality, <laughs> the challenge of our spirituality is to reach there, <laughs> to reach there. And so, for me, it's, it's really, it's a beautiful thing because it says that you, you, cannot, you cannot be a Catholic in that sense. You cannot be a truly Eucharistic person if you are not a radically transformative person. <laughs> you know? If you are not a radically committed person. You know? If you are not a, a person who's always seen the world and the, the situations in the world and the poverty of the world as a challenge. I mean, that's the spirituality. You know? I was just thinking of when you were, when you were talking about it called Mary Teresa. There's a little joke about Mary Teresa. I don't know if you all know that one, you know? When um, Mary Teresa died and she went to heaven, you know? And, you know, and St. Peter showed her, you know, all the places. Mary Teresa was so happy, you know? She, oh, wow, wow, wonderful, wonderful. And then when St. Peter was finished, she said, That's all? She said, Yes. Say, there are no poor people here? <laughs> and St. Peter said, this is heaven. I'm not sure it's disappointed. <laughs> Just a take on that. Thank you, Monsignor Anthony, for bringing this section of the lecture series to the end. Let us give his grace once again a round of applause for his... Um, just as we were sharing also on, on, in the question, and I, I just also, something came to me that we should mention, that we're not in it alone, that the Eucharist is about receiving Christ. And so even as we become aware of it, that Christ is with us on the journey, because if we just think of it as what we have to do, then it can be overwhelming. But if we recognize that we are working with Christ, then it becomes a little more bearable and his grace will help us through. So we have come to the end of the third lecture in the Father John Reginald Lecture Series. On behalf of the board, management, and staff of the Cardinal Felix, Kelvin Felix Archdiocese Pastoral Center, I would like to thank you for taking the time to be with us for this lecture. We are sure many more persons would have liked to be in here, but for various reasons could not. We solicit your assistance in spreading the word and letting them know that they can view this lecture on the Archdiocese of Castries YouTube channel and the Facebook page on, on Wednesday the 18th, the 18th. We would also like to thank the sponsors who have helped us pull this together. We want to thank Domino Pizzas, we want to thank Janu Credit Union, and we want to thank Cox & Company for their assistance to in putting this lecture series together. We would like to extend an invitation to you and to persons who, uh, other persons who would like to be part of our in-house audience for the fourth lecture in the series, which is Poverty, Poverty Reduction Strategies in St. Lucia. This lecture will be presented by Dr. Ezra Jabatis, who has extensive experience in projects and activities aimed at reducing poverty in St. Lucia. Lecture number four will be held on Saturday, October 14th at 10.30 right here at the, at the Pastoral Center. And therefore, we look forward to you joining us and others. So. And if there's a need for you to get in touch with us at the Pastoral Center, you can simply contact us at telephone number 452-0790. Once again, thank you and God bless.